Hello, this, my name is Eli. This is your epiphany. One minute. My name is Gina Fingelman, and I'm the preschool director here at Epiphany. On February 5th from 6 to 8 p.m., Epiphany will host our annual father and daughter dance. 
the sanctuary will be transformed into a world-class ballroom, perfect for making lasting memories. If you are a dad and your daughter is between 18 months and eighth grade, we would love for you to join us for a night of dancing and fun. Your friends and family members are welcome to come too. We will have a live DJ, light refreshments, desserts, and a photographer to capture this experience. This is a free event, but please register using the link below so that we can be prepared for our guests. Hey Epiphany family, Josh here. I am so excited to share with all of you that we are having our upcoming 2022 confirmation retreat. That's right, you heard it here folks. We are going back to Camp Lone Star in LaGrange, Texas over the weekend of February 11th through the 13th. That'll be Friday evening into Sunday afternoon. The really cool thing is that your students, sixth through eighth grade, don't even have to be part of our confirmation program to attend. If you're looking for more information about this retreat, you can either email me or you can simply click the registration link in the newsletter. And with that, I want to welcome you all, and we're so glad you're here. I told you a few weeks ago that you're going to have both pastors healthy at the same time. <laughs> I, I am a man of my word. Yes. Delighted to be working again with him and, and, uh, and just delighted to be with you. Please rise and let us join in our worship.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Jesus Christ was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. God has come down to us to make us his own children. Let us confess our sins of unbelief, that he may give us faith to receive him and his love. O God, we confess that we have ignored your voice and spirit by choosing to go our own way. Without you, we are lost and confused and without hope. Without you, we do not know love. Come now to us and forgive our waywardness and weakness. Give us your gifts of faith, hope, and love. Receive us again into the family of your redeemed. Amen. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. In the stead, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you know we live in the midst of so many dangers that in our frailty we cannot stand upright. Grant strength and protection to support us in all dangers and carry us through all temptations. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. The Old Testament reading comes from the first chapter of Jeremiah, verses 4 through 10. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am only a youth, for to all to whom I send you, you shall go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. <coughs> this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle reading is from the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians, verses 31b through chapter 13, verse 13. I will show you a still more excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast, it is not arrogant or rude, it does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us stand for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the fourth chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. Jesus went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. And in the synagogue there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, Ha! Ah, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, 
be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown down him down in their midst, he came out of him, having done him no harm. And they were all amazed and said to one another, What is his word? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And reports about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. And he arose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. Now Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever, and they appealed to him on her behalf. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she rose and began to serve them. Now when the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak, because they knew that he was the Christ. And when it was day, he departed and went into a desolate place. And the people sought him and came to him and would have kept him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Good. 
Thank you. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. King. King. Wild stuff. Our text for today is not the night. It's right there. And they were all amazed and said to one another, what is this word? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirit. Luke 4. And they come out and reports about him went out in every place in the surrounding region. Two times in the text before us from the gospel, you have the word authority there. People were impressed with the way Jesus was, the way he spoke, the way he did things. But let's have a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to be here, to focus on your gift of authority. If we didn't have Jesus, we wouldn't know what to do with it. But because of Jesus, even though we often don't know what to do with it, we know where we are to look when help is needed. So help us, Lord, fall more under your authority in how we live, in how we speak, and how we are. In Jesus' name, amen. Authority. I was laughing at this whole premise because I'm a military kid. I'm a Navy brat, okay? And I'm a preacher's kid. So for me to talk about authority, this is uh, foreign territory for sure. My dad would be impressed. My dad actually listened to my sermon last week, called me. I got to be careful when I quote my dad because somehow he realizes I, I quoted him and I was good. I said what I needed to say last week and I didn't say too much more. And those are fun conversations to have with father and son. And uh, thank you for being part of that as well. Authority. Authority changed around the 1960s. Not that it didn't before that, but then all of a sudden it became cemented in our culture. It's okay to question authority. In fact, much of the 1960s, if you think of the rock stars back then, Rolling Stones, others, it was Beatles. It was all to, to go against authority. A lot of their songs had it. A lot of like Bob Dylan movements. It was, it was just becoming ingrained. It's not that people didn't respect authority before. But now people were questioning authority like no time before. And people that survived through the 60s more than me, I was born in 66, so I'm not, I don't even know. I just know what I've seen in TVs and Forrest Gump. Okay, let's be honest. One of the great, one of the great teachings on the 60s. Um, and I, I, I just know that, that what my dad talks about the 60s as a pastor starting up, he talks about how difficult it was at times in 1962 and following with all the transitions that were happening in our culture, some very good, especially when it came to racial things and such as that. I mean, I mean, wonderful stuff happened in the 60s to help get us to where we're at now. But the 60s, authorities started to become questioned, you know? Uh, military men or women were coming back from, from being overseas, they'd come back and some were getting spat upon, coming back from Vietnam and all these things, and, and it was just, it was a time of transition. And now we're at, still at that. We, we, you know, authority is still not what it once was. In fact, authority has maneuvered in such a crass way to now whatever you believe to be your authority, that's okay. Just as long as I can have what I believe to be my authority. And if they intermingle, I, let's not hurt one another as we do it. Or here's another way of saying it. What's true for you is true for me. Or not necessarily true for me, but, but it's true for you. And what's true for me is not necessarily true for you. Or truth is relative, um, uh, authority is whatever you believe it to be, whatever you put, you put your, your, your focus on, whatever you bow to, that's your authority and that's okay. Doesn't matter who it is, what it is, authority. That's, that's kind of the world we live in now. It's, it's, it's uh, sliding into this idea where it's so relativistic you almost can't communicate with each other because if your truth is indeed your truth and my truth is my truth, how are we going to bridge this here? Kind of difficult to see how that all works together. I would just raise my voice. You raise your emotions. I'll raise my emotions. You raise your voice. Let's see where that brings us. Oh, that brings us to 2022. And that's where we're at. Jesus had something about him, didn't he? The people said so. They said that he speaks with authority. Now, what did that mean? Well, we get some notion of what this means. Jesus didn't quote a whole bunch of dead teachers and living teachers to make his point. Jesus just said, here's what the scriptures say, boom. 
Then in the Sermon on the Mount, he does something really interesting. Matthew 5 through 7, he actually takes, you have heard it said before, and he takes God's word from Exodus 20. And then Jesus does something that the religious leaders of his day would have picked up on immediately. And Jesus says, but I tell you today, he was equating himself with God. That's not the first time he did that, so it's not the last time he did that, but that's the reason that he was placed on the cross. You do know that, right? It was because people, he was saying he was God, and there were people that couldn't stand that, and they got rid of him because of that. So Jesus was, when it came to authority, Jesus was claiming to be the ultimate of all authority. And yet, if you looked at him, you'd be like, well, I don't know. Looks like a regular guy. I heard he was a carpenter's son, grew up in Nazareth. Look at the people, the bozos he's hanging out with. You know, some are cool, but some, you know, they're just there because they're getting the ride. And, uh, and he doesn't appeal to everybody. Look, the religious leaders aren't following him. They don't really care for him. What's going on here? We're like, what's the deal with this guy? And so people struggled with him. And then Jesus spoke. And not only spoke, but he did things. In our gospel text today, we see where, where people were, looked forward to the authority. Now, I know lots of stories. And one of my favorites is still Lord of the Flies and all the incarnations of it. It's sort of like Romeo and Juliet. It's one of those stories you take and you could just place it in a different environment. Um, it could be the 100, you know, that, that's like Lord of the Flies as well. But Lord of the Flies is the story where the kids all have no adults and now they're making the rules. And they've gotten rid of all authority. And the premise is, is that once you get rid of all authority, you'll have freedom. You'll have freedom and joy. I have fallen for that. Maybe you've fallen for that too. But the idea that if we just get rid of the authority. I usually saw it happen when I was a kid in, with substitute teachers. You know? The idea was a substitute teacher. Hey, it's a party. Every now and then we'd get one, though, who was still working on his or her teaching certificate. Not a party at all. Not fun. And we would go up against the authority and question it. We'd challenge it only to find some of us meeting the dean for the day, you know? Hey, how you doing? How you doing? Well, I'm a substitute teacher. thought, well, sit there for a while and think it through. Authority. You know, Jesus had that authority, though. When he spoke, people would just love to listen to him. And when he spoke, he didn't mince words. He was like John the Baptist. When John the Baptist came in, people loved listening to him because he said it how it needed to be said. Maybe not always polished. But, oh, he said what needed to be said. And Jesus was the same way. But Jesus didn't just speak, did he? He did things. Look at the day that we have before us in the gospel. He, 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 he cleansed somebody of a demon. He healed somebody who had demonic stuff going on. I don't understand all that, but he did it. And he did it enough where people kind of understood that about him. Not only that, we have Peter's mother-in-law in here, and she has a fever, and Jesus has authority over that fever. He takes care of that. So look at this. He's got demonic spirits under his authority. He's got the bodily way we operate, the function, that they, they, our health is under his authority. Doesn't stop there, though, does it? You know, We find that, that this same Jesus, he also has nature under his authority. He can calm waves with words. He can create, you know, to feed 5,000 and 4,000 with just a few morsels of food. He's amazing. He like, just does things. And if that ain't all, three times we're told he raised people from the dead, like had authority over death itself. Whew. So, so here's all this authority stuff. And then Jesus, but here's the thing about Jesus. When he shows us authority, he doesn't show us authority like, like the world often does. Jesus doesn't make a grandiose stand. He doesn't demand everybody cow to him and don't look at him because he's holier than everybody else. Instead, what he does in his authority is he becomes like us in every way, yet without sin. He, 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 he becomes one of us. And he takes on the humbling ways about us as well. He doesn't just take the grand, you know, the, the elitist ways we are, but he became a carpenter's son. Grew up in a kind of regular, just family. Knew what it was probably like to have a splinter. Knew what it was like to have friends. Knew what it was like to not always have a day where it was just sunshine everywhere you walked. And he did all that. And yet he's God. That's what he inferred. That's what he said. That's what he died for. 
because he said he was God. Whoa, he's God? Yeah, that's him. That's what Jesus is. He's God. He's not just, just God for a little bit, just using a bit of power. He's God who came to this world, took all his power, pushed it aside so that he could get on with the mission. And what was the mission? Well, you, you saw it in the gospel. That's a great song, by the way. But look at this in the end here. He says, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. That's what he came to accomplish. But along the way, he revealed a bit about who he is and what he's about through his actions, through his words. And people around him were grateful, and we still are. Already today, he's done the same thing with you and me. Through me, he's forgiven your sins. Not because I'm a great guy, but because God has decided to use me as a conduit. How do I know that? Because I was called through the congregation, all these other things that went into play. It wasn't just a feeling one day that I got up and I said, you know what, I'm going to forgive people. Uh -uh. All happened in the way that he does his authority, carries it out through the congregation, gave me a call, and then I became, you know, I decided, to, yeah, I guess the Lord wants me here, and boom, next thing you know. And now I'm the guy, along with Pastor Leland, we're the guys who publicly forgive sins of the congregation. You do it privately, but we all do it under the same power, under the Lord and Master Jesus Christ. That's the only one who allows us, enables us to do that. So that's the authority. And then we have the Lord's Supper here. And the Lord's Supper, God is still with his authority forgiving our sins and assuring us those sins are forgiven because sometimes words, like in our own relationships, words are meaningless. You know, you, know, you say you love me. Okay, well what kind of actions back it up. And God knows that's how we operate. And so he comes to us not only in word, but also with wine and bread to assure us through these visible signs that the words are true as well. And not only that, look at the symbolism. He, you ingest him into your body because why? He said you're his temple. And so very visibly, he makes you the temple. This is his authority. And his authority is kind of cool. Because his authority brings a lot of good stuff with it. But we still fight it. We still fight it because the idea of someone being a king over our lives is kind of repulsive. I don't think we're really aware of what a king is all about. You can watch movies and maybe you get a dose, but you still don't know what it's like to live under a king. Like a real king in this world who says, I don't think you all are eating the right crops this year. You need to stop eating those crops and plant new ones. But we've been, no, I'm the king, that's the way it is, and everyone has to do it. Well, pastor, no, that's not American, no, that's not American, I know, but that's how kings operate. But not our king. Our king is so cool that the demands he places on us are the same demands that, that he placed on himself. Our king is so cool that, that he showed us the way, and he even suffered and died for the way, and he said, I'm not above this either. And then he tells us, go, do that, love people, forgive people, do what I do. Be gracious, be merciful, be loving, be accepting. This is what authority in Christ looks like. It's joyous. It's something you want to be around. You, it's, 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 it's not Lord of the Flies. It's something opposite. It's beautiful. When God is in control, things work well. But here's another caveat. Even when God is in control, sometimes things don't look, by all appearances, like they're all that well. And this is where the theology of keeping God in authority comes into play. For instance, the cross. When you look at the cross, it looks like it's a mess. Oh, this isn't how it's supposed to go. Three years, now this. And yet, we know in faith that in that cross, God was doing his most marvelous work. Because God works through opposites. God works in ways that don't always make sense to the world around us, nor us as well. It's what keeps God, God. The king comes as a baby. The king brings life through death. I mean, he's spirit, and yet he assures us of his presence through physical wine and bread. Our king loves to work in ways that challenge our ideas of authority in this world so that we in faith, we reveal the authority that is ours. 
and all the good stuff that comes. I put a picture, oh, this is, uh, this is your commandment for today. The fourth commandment, honor your father and mother. I had confirmation this last week, and it was so much fun. I had a game where the kids had to list. I said, you've got to list six of the Ten Commandments, and here's what the kid did. And I know the kid's parents, and so I understood where this was coming from. The first commandment was, thou shalt have no other gods. And then the kid immediately said, honor your father and mother. And I said, oh, your parents have done a good job on you. And uh, so it says, we should fear and love God so that we do not despise nor anger our parents and other authorities, but honor them, serve and obey them, love and cherish them. We, we go up, up against this fourth commandment lots, but he didn't. He followed it perfectly, without sin. And because of that, now he's an absolute authority. The footstool. Why the footstool? Well, if you know anything about ancient cultures back then, they would take the king's heads of those they conquered. Like, the king conquered another land, took the king, took his head, took his kids' heads maybe, and would make a stool out of them. I know it's grisly. It's barbaric. This is why we're in the modern age. But back then, this is what they did. And that way, when you walked in that throne room and you saw the king with his foot on the stool and you knew that those were the heads of all these former kings in the area, that you knew who was boss. Okay? Well, that's the image used here, but look what Jesus has under his feet. Well, first of all, let's look at Jesus' foot. Look at that picture there all over the place. You got the dove, that's the Holy Spirit. That's cool, we got that. We got the cross. Now, the kneeling figure to the left, what's that? That's Jesus washing feet. Not praying, washing feet. And Jesus is serving, and then when he dies on the cross, he serves without any limits. He's no limits to his servanthood, even his death is, is okay. His life is gone. And then, but what happens? He rises again from the grave and ascends into heaven. What, to, to be a spirit again? No, this is an interesting part of Christ. It never says in the Bible that he gave up his human nature. It says that he took on human nature when he was conceived, but it never says he gave it up again. And it's all tied into our sacrament of Holy Communion. This is his wine and, bre you know, wine and, and bread, but it's also his body and blood because he's still a physical being and a spiritual being. It's not our saying. This is what the Bible infers, and this is very important. Because when we die and we go to heaven, we're going to have a body again. We're not going to be spirits floating around. We're going to have some sort of... Jesus, when he became incarnate, he blessed physical life. Whereas many people say in the Greek mindset, oh, spirit can never take on flesh. Otherwise, the flesh would consume the spirit. Therefore, there always has to be a separation. No, nah, God said, forget that. I've got this. And that's what he did. But because of everything he did, look what's under his feet. Sin. That's that circle curved in on itself. And isn't that what sin is? You ever been in a fight? <laughs> I've been in a fight. I'll show you what sin looks like. Watch me fight sometime. I'm all about me. I don't care about your feeling. I want to win. Win, 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 win. And I know you're the same way. Otherwise, you'd give in to me. But you don't. Because we all want to do that. That's sin. Sin thinks about self and nothing but self. And if we're honest with ourselves, we have moments like that. Not every moment. Sometimes we surprise ourselves. But there's many moments where the first thought is, what's in it for me? And we can't get past that just stays there. We hide it from others, but we know. Next thing, the tablets, the yellow tablets, the law. Jesus lived perfectly. His authority is such that he's God. He fulfilled the very law that he gave you and me that we can't keep. He did it. He fulfilled it. He lived perfectly, unblemished. He's the Lamb of God. He was meant to suffer and be the sacrifice for our sins, and the only way he could do that is by living the life perfectly that we could not live in our place, and substituting his life in our place, taking the punishment, which is the gavel, that we deserve, he took all that. And now that has no more power. That has no more power over you either. The condemning law has no power. You've been forgiven. You've been forgiven. Today we were talking about abortion and Bible study, and the one thing I walked away from the classes, I was walking down the hall, I said, oh my goodness, what was I thinking? I should have made perfectly clear that even if you had an abortion, the forgiveness of Jesus is still big enough. And I should have started the class with that and ended the class with that, not because I want to give everybody a green light with abortion, but because I know that the person who's been involved in a sin that is repulsive and sometimes being exposed, that sometimes the person thinks, uh-oh, 
I've entered that realm of sin that can't be forgiven. And I'm here to say, no, you have not. It's been forgiven. Jesus took it all. Even that, death. Three times Jesus raised people from the grave that we know, but then there's the whole story of himself and how he raised his own body from the grave. Okay? That's how powerful he is. That's his authority. Next, the cosmos. He's in charge of everything. The book of Colossians brings this out kind of clear. The book of Revelation, if you want to dive into that, really brings it out. But the idea is that Jesus is in control of everything. Everything. All the stars out there, all the Star Wars universe, and then you've got the Star Trek universe over here. You don't want to spend too much time on this one. It gets weird. But over here, it's all good. Right, Josh? Yes. No, I've been watching. I've been watching Boba Fett. I've been watching Mandalore. I'm on. I know it. But I still like Star Trek. Um, then you got Satan. He has no power over Jesus. Seems like he does, but none. How do we know all this? Because Jesus rose from the grave, showing his absolute authority over the very thing that scares us. Three things, actually. Sin, death, and the world. And when he took all those things on the cross to the grave and he came back, he showed not even those things are more powerful than me. I was talking with somebody the other day about the election. I don't know why this came up. We're, what, five years after it, but the election... And the person was saying, if God's in control, isn't this the way it's supposed to be happening right now? I said, oh, that's insightful. Not really for the the, the person who wants justice and all these other things I hear about, but that's insightful. I don't know how that all fits, but I do know God is sovereign. Not as much as my Baptist brothers and sisters. They go into heavy detail on this. God is sovereign. That's the whole thread they they weave the Bible through. We as Lutherans do law, gospel, law, gospel, law, gospel. But the Baptists, they've got something going on here, and it's good. It's just got one weakness at the end when you start wondering about where evil came from or where Satan came from. And if God is absolutely sovereign, eh, it starts to incorporate him into that thinking. That can't be because God didn't create a mess and then clean it up and then want praise for all eternity for that. God didn't create these problems in the world. We did. Genesis 1 through 11. Adam and Eve, women, man and women, responsible for disobeying God. Their children, why do brother and fight brother? Cain and Abel. God's not responsible for that. That's sin again. What about the secular and the spiritual? When, why Noah came? You figure out the story of the Nephilim and the women of this world. I don't know. But the point seems to be that the spiritual and the, and the physical, there, there's a rift because of sin, not God's fault again. And then nation versus nation, the Tower of Babel, God's not responsible for that either. God's not responsible for sin, but God certainly has done something about it. And he did it through Jesus, and he did it through the lordship of Jesus, and he still does it through his lordship today, through you and me. We're his ambassadors. I'm not good enough for God. No, you're not. But God's more than good enough for you. And he's more than good enough for the people around you. And so the beautiful thing about God's authority is you can trust his authority. It's got a record. God can even use the greatest chaos the world can throw, which is the death of his son. And God can make order and joy out of that. That's the authority I want over my life. And that's the authority God wants over your life as well. I don't know where you're at with your relationship with God, but today, today could be a day where you just challenge God a bit. Challenge your relationship with him and say, you know what, God, I've been flirting with you being my king, but today I heard Pastor Mucko, that crazy old pastor, and I believe that maybe it's time for me to let you be king. And see what happens. I think you'll be surprised at how joyful that is. It's not giving up. It's actually receiving something and more. But I'll let you and God decide how that works out. So may God bless you with his authority. May God bless you with Jesus. May God bless you with the knowledge that all things are under his feet. He's got everything under his feet. Even the things that don't make sense in your life, he's got those too. And may God give you glory and joy and all the blessings. And may God also give you lips to give him praise and speak about him to others who also don't know him yet. For you know better. And I do too. May we always give God the proper authority he is due. Not just when people are watching, but even when people aren't watching. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us rise. 
And let us join together in these words. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, Son of God begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, being not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Christian apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I live for the resurrection of the dead, and life of the world to come. Amen. It is prayer time at Epiphany, and we have several prayer requests. First of all, the flowers are given by Bernie and Frank Weibargen in honor and celebration of their 68th wedding anniversary. We have Linda Connor. Linda Connor has suffered the loss of her father. Leo Gadecki died this past Monday. He will be cremated and buried at Bethlehem Lutheran in Adair, Oklahoma on February 26th, and so prayers for peace and comfort for the family. And then Mary Campbell. Mary Campbell has a praise report, prayer, thanksgiving for successful foot reconstruction surgery. Praise the Lord, everything went well. She has a two to three month recovery time. Annette Spivey, the same thing, prayer of thanksgiving for successful aortic valve replacement surgery. Praise the Lord, everything went well. Annette hopes to be back in church in about two to three weeks. Pam Greshel, another praise, prayer of thanksgiving for the miraculous healing of her cousin Ryan, of all symptoms and issues that had placed him in the hospital in, in Tulsa. It, I mean, they were thinking the boy was going to be close to dying, and then overnight, kabam, 
everything cleared off his body, everything. It was amazing. So, miraculous healing. He's gone home. He's a healthy and happy second grader. Praise the Lord. And then uh, Cynthia Jensen, prayers for healing for her grandson, Tyler. He's being released from the hospital, but he does have uh, continuing issues with his liver. Sonia Mucko. Sonia still has her sinus infection. Prayers for healing for her. Donna Mitschke. Prayers for healing. Donna is battling COVID, bronchitis, and pneumonia in the hospital. And prayers for strength and healing for her son, John, who is supporting his mother. Jackie Bungie continues in MD Anderson Hospital with nausea and other issues. Also, my wife, Melanie, prayers for healing. Melanie will have a CT scan on her carotid carotid artery on on Wednesday, February the 2nd. She's got a 70% blockage in her right and 40% blockage in her left. And so the CT scan is to discover what's going to be the next steps for her. We also have from, this is from Bob and Linda Hamm. They, they have a new baby girl born to Kirby and Mark Hamm. So a baby girl born Saturday morning, 329. And so a new grandbaby, God bless you. And then the family of... Hank Wood. This this is a very close personal friend of Ron and Becky Brandt. Hank passed away suddenly, unexpectedly, at the age of 54, and his funeral will be this coming Tuesday. So prayers for peace and comfort for the family also. Let us stand and go to the Lord in prayer. O God of love, Thanks and praise be to you for sending your only begotten Son into our flesh to open your kingdom by means of his love and deliverance and glory on the cross. Greater love has no one than this. Work in us, your children, the gift of your love, that we be enabled to endure the struggles of faith and hope to reflect your true glory all our days. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Establish your whole church in this congregation to be walking and serving together in love for you and love toward one another and the world, that many come to knowledge of your truth and salvation. Grant your strength and blessing to all who preach your life-giving word and those who serve as your loving hands, to all who are in any need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Grant your grace and wisdom to all who serve in the government of our country. Give strength and integrity to those in the armed forces and to all who serve and protect us in our communities. Give all agencies dedicated to the service of helping and healing people the freedom to do their good works for the support of all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear hear also now our prayers for all who are sick or hospitalized, the injured and the lonely, especially all we have mentioned and all whom we give to you now from our hearts. Grant that your healing love be administered faithfully by the medical professionals and those who supply the needy in any way. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also after supper, He took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, 
Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament of my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please be seated.
O God, the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in the sacrament. And we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be, may be enabled constantly to serve you through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now may this, the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you steadfast in the true faith and the life everlasting. Depart in peace, your sins are forgiven. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.